Welcome in Cover One Draft Weekly. John Helmkamp with my buddy Daniel Harms back on the mic. It is post NFL Combine. There are so many guys to talk about. So many people balled out down there, jumped out the building, made themselves some money. Some didn't. We're going to talk about it. Daniel was there in person. Buddy, what was uh, your general impression of the event, of Indy, everything? Tell me about it. Man, it was. It was amazing. First, I want to just thank Cover One for, you know, allowing me to go and affording me the opportunity to represent them at the Combine. And the experience will not ever be forgotten, especially considering my very first Combine, there was a record-setting performance put on by Xavier Worthy, and I got to watch it. Like, just that moment will forever live in my mind. Like, being there, seeing all these guys, listen, listening to him talk at the podium, and then knowing what he was going for getting out there running that four two five and saying you know what nah i'm gonna go for the record and then We're bringing it back absolutely crushing it so that was that that moment will forever be cemented in, in my mind but everything just the stadium was incredible i've never been to indy before and it was my first time being there i was a mile, about a mile and a half from the convention center at my airbnb so both days after re realizing it was going to cost me like 50 bucks to park down there, I walked instead. And I was like, I'm not doing this. And, <laughs> and it was it was just a ridiculously cool, close-knit place. I don't want it to ever move. I know there's yeah. talk about it moving. It's set up perfectly. It is the best place. The convention center is right there. Lucas Oil Stadium is right there. There's a ton of places to go eat. I did try the shrimp cocktail. You should do it if you ever get there. But after that, I'm never doing it again. And <laughs> but it was great, man. It was it was fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, everything that I've ever heard from anybody who goes to the scouting combine says absolutely just rave reviews about how they put it on, how they host it, the layout of everything. I've never heard a bad thing about it. So for them to consider moving it, it's under contract. They got one more year, uh, 2024, as of right now. I hope that it stays in Indy forever as well, just from everything that I've heard. I hope that I get to experience that and, and see it in Indy because it seems like it's just been an incredible host city and event for this kind of penultimate pre-draft experience, really. Yeah. Other than that, you got pro days. You know, we'll have a lot of pro days coming up to, to talk about. But when last time you get all these players from all these different schools in the same building, uh, with a little under two months until they figure out where they're going in the NFL draft and make their NFL dreams realized. Pretty cool stuff. Let's just start. Why not? Let's start with Xavier yeah. Worthy. Let's just go sure. right in to the headliner of the show. Our boy, remember, cover one draft weekly, flag plant on uh, one oh, Xavier yeah. Worthy being an incredible NFL wide receiver. We we fully buy it, fully in. And then he, he drops the 4 one official 40 and my goodness it looked like he was just cooking the turf it was nuts dude like i i know that he tweeted out that he played at 165 last year which i don't know if i buy or not because he looked much more stacked on the field granted mm -hmm. there's pads and stuff like that but regardless regardless i don't care what weight you're at when you run a 421 you are flying it is immeasurable speed to, to watch happen like it was and in the second one his get off was beautiful it was seamless yeah. you could tell that the track background is there because it was all so fluid he gets you know his head down for a, maybe the first 10 15 yards and then it's just smooth into his head transitioning up and then he watches at the end to see the time and, and then he does the whole arm oh my goodness dude and it wasn't even just the 40 he jumped 41 inches in the air yeah. he, he's a legit athlete and nearly you know an 11 foot broad jump this is a guy who is an actual athlete. It's not just straight line speed. I do yeah. wish he would have done three cone because I've shown to people that he's quicker than he gets a lot of credit for too, but he's going to do drills at his pro day. I also am very interested to see what he weighs in his pro day. I'm interested. I'm thinking 170. I don't know about you. What, you. what do you think? I, I think he's going to be eating his Wheaties a little bit uh, after the combine. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised by that, but hey, 
Listen, in the, in the past, the, the wide receivers in particular that come out and run the blazing 40 times has not always translated to NFL success. Yeah. We knew that he was fast, fast. We knew that it's on tape. It's, it's very easy to see that he's fast, fast in the open field, cooks defenders on those deep routes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I think I don't want him to get lumped into the conversation with like a John Ross because he is not just a one-dimensional straight line speed wide receiver this is a very good wide receiver with route running ability contested catch ability yak obviously because of that athleticism but it's not just straight line speed he has agility he has ability to to cut and move and change direction quickly and decelerate also which we love talking about deceleration he's not just fast he can take that speed to threaten a defender and then throttle down incredibly quickly and snap off on his routes this is a very, very good wide receiver. He's a well-rounded wide receiver, and he also just happens to be blazing fast with the 4-2-140. Absolutely. And I, I'm excited because I just, just broke his film down on rjrfootball.com. It's, yes, it is tied into the Chiefs, but it's an entire comprehensive breakdown. It's what he does well. It's what he doesn't do well. Talk about things he needs to work on, all that stuff included. So he's going to be going in the first round. I don't think that there's a team that will – will stop themselves. Someone is going to do it. I don't know where it's going to be. I don't know when it is, but I, I can tell you right now, he will be a first round draft pick. I know that he didn't move on some people's big boards, um, but for you and me, he's already in the top five, top four wide receivers in this, in this class. He was always there. So he did get a bump up for me though. You guys know I had Keon Coleman at four and it wasn't the 40 time that did it for me. It went back to the film and it's yeah. like, especially cause I just did the film review. So I'm just like, I have to. I have to bump him up because I do know that this this skill set transitions. It translates to the NFL and what he does. And I, I do think that that's going to make a big impact. So, yeah, it's been – it was a great experience to watch him do that. And then, obviously, you know, I can't wait to watch him do the drills at Texas because he'll be catching balls from Quinn Ewers and it'll be nice, like, welcome back to the – you know, to Texas and just get through your catching drills and stuff like that. It'll kind of show everyone that he can catch the football five drops and seven drops the year before and the year before that. But you know, that's one thing here, neither here nor there at this point. 41 inch vert, 10 feet, 11 inch broad. Uh, Obviously the record for the fastest 40 ever. Uh, One of the fastest 10 yard splits ever at 1.5 seconds. (laughs) This is 149 on the NFL. Oh, you have a 149? Okay. Well, that's just even better. I have one. I have one five. What I'm looking at a RAS right now. They got it at a one five. But I mean, for a guy that's a 5'11, 165, which the 165 got him a 0.35 in terms of the RAS score for that thing, for him to still have a 9.37 RAS score weighing 165 pounds, that's silly. Like, this is an incredibly athletic guy. Why don't we just go to his teammate? Why don't we talk about uh, Adonai Mitchell, A.D. Mitchell, um, who also ran very, very fast. And to my pleasant surprise, weighed in 10 pounds heavier than he was listed. He was listed at 195, weighed in at 205. So to get over 200 pounds and to drop a 4-3-3-40, that's a a big improvement. His athletic testing was, was nutty. Yeah, it was a little unexpected, at least the 40 time. And we're going to do this with, so with Adonai, with Adani Mitchell and Brian Thomas, we're going to talk about both both these guys because yep. they were much more athletic than their film suggests. And obviously, when we're doing these, we want to see what they run and go back to the film. You have to go back to it. You can't just say, "Okay, well, he ran a four three five. Well, we're just going to write that down and we're going to bump him up our grades." Like that's not how this should work. Go look for it, and I can tell you now, that's nowhere on his tape. It's nowhere. There is no four three five on his tape. It's not there, and that's not a bad thing. But the explosiveness, the one five two ten yard split, is there. That's mm-hmm. there. Like the that explosiveness, even the the strength explosion that he has in the first five yards or the first the couple steps he takes is all there. So that was always nice to see. <clears throat> so he, he did come in at six two. You know, not six four, not six five. It, it's six two. So. That it's not concerning by any stretch. Six, you know, six two two oh five is perfect X material. This is a mm-hmm. guy we know that is, you know, jumps nearly 40 inches in the vertical 11 4 broad jump. So that lower body explosion is legit. It's there. It's real. Um, 
so the only thing that I was questioning again was that speed. And I went back to the tape and it's just not there. And so kudos to him for training to getting that, that number down there because teams love that four three number. They absolutely love it. And it bumps them up on a lot of teams boards just does. So that's a great work ethic from him because you need that, especially with his tape, having some of the taking plays off, not running routes all the way through to be able to come in, put the work in to run a four, three, four, four, three, five on your edge of 40 is a really great, a really great job on him. So not many questions about, about his tape. He's, you know, he's a good player and he had a really great combine performance. That's going to definitely earn him some money. Do you think he's in the first round consideration for teams now because of that size and speed combo and the athletic testing? I, I'm starting to think that he is. I don't have him as a first round type wide receiver because to me, he's a little bit of a project. But every once in a while, when you watch the tape, he flashes. He'll he'll make a great catch. He'll, he'll show the athleticism. He'll show really good route running in goal to go situations. He'll mm-hmm. show it on deeper to intermediate routes also. Um, I, I think there's definitely a lot of tools there I don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to evaluate him because a lot of this is projection with him. I don't think that he's one of these wide receivers that has the great production profile. He doesn't, I mean, this last year was good, but before that it wasn't yeah. one year of good production um, playing alongside Xavier worthy, which one's truly the one in that offense, which one's the two. It, it's kind of a tough conversation. They're kind of just one, a one B split it however you want. But the size, the athleticism, his ability to jump, that ability to go up and get it is there. One of my biggest issues with him on tape was that I felt like defenders played through him very frequently. I thought he had passes broken up quite a lot. People point to the fact that he had one drop, and that very only did drop, but defenders played through his hands consistently to break up passes. So I don't know. Maybe him bulking up 10 pounds – is his way of being like the way that I'm going to make my money at the next level. I have to be stronger. I have to be bigger and tougher at the catch point. Maybe he put in that work because of it. But again, that's a lot of projection. So I don't know if I can just write off that issue that I saw on tape because Mm -hmm. he came in 10 pounds heavier, but I can also see it helping him translate to the next level because he was able to bulk up a little bit. So It's tough for me. I think that he, I think that he definitely kind of climbed a little bit for me, just seeing the athleticism, seeing him a little bit uh, stockier than what he was, was listed at getting over 200 pounds is nice. 6'2", 205 is, is a fine body composition for an outside wide receiver in the NFL. I don't know. I, I still think that I have him in that wide receiver, maybe six to eight range. There's a group of wide receivers there that we can kind of have the conversation about that are all, they all have question marks. They're all really athletic. They're all kind of bigger wide receivers and how you shake it up is going to be a matter of personal preference. Yeah. And this kind of is the uh, X receiver draft. Is it not? You've got Marvin Harrison jr. At the, the top of that, <clears throat> you can say Brian Thomas jr. Is an X receiver. We also have, you know, Adnan Mitchell, Ke- Keon Coleman. You've got uh, Jalen Polk. You could say Roma Dunze is one too, if you really want to, but he could play it all. So this is a big wide receiver class. If it weren't, I would say Mitchell would be in consideration for a first round pick. But for me, you know, it's not going to move him into that category. I do think that there's going to be a team that that loves him. Like that that's that's just going to happen. And it would not shock me if in after pick 2022, okay, well, let's go ahead and take him now. He's not going to be there in the second round when we when we want to probably draft him so let's do that now and maybe we can get somebody else that we want so there's a lot of players that are going to go in the first round that and we're not going to have first round grades on that's just that, yeah. that's just make a no no bones about this i don't have 32 first round grades i just don't and i don't right. think anybody does if you do you might want to be a little more nitpicky about what you're grading and you know what there is though there's a yeah. lot of top 50 grades and that's where it gets close right i i agree it's like 100 you, yeah, exactly. And that's where it gets interesting. And I think having the conversation, I think we touched on it on our last episode. I think I might have brought up the same that I think teams are going to start looking at wide receiver a little bit like quarterback in the sense of one fifth option. So it might be a player that you might not have. I might have said it, I might not have, but I've been thinking it. Wide receivers are getting expensive and they're starting to make quarterback money. Justin Jefferson's expected to make like maybe 30 million a year. I mean, yeah. that's crazy talk. So you might start getting to the point where with wide receivers, 
you might not like them as a first round pick, quote unquote, but you might either move up from an early second pick to a late first to get a wide receiver because it gives you an extra year of team control on the contract. So I can see that being a shift yeah. that kind of starts happening in the NFL over the coming years as early as this year. You're looking at teams late in this first round pick. I know Tampa Bay is bringing back Mike Evans, which is great for them, but they also have to start planning for the future. Do they go first round wide receiver there? It's possible. Dallas at 24 could absolutely be looking for an outside wide receiver. I could see that happening. Um, Baltimore at 30, I could see them wanting a big body outside wide receiver. Like there's a lot of teams as you get late into the first or these that are in the second that might get trading up with one of those later picks to go up and get a guy that they think they can build with that has the athletic profile and the size to be a true outside wide receiver. I don't know. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Interesting to see how the board shakes out during the draft. Absolutely. And so let's kind of transition really quickly to Brian Thomas Jr., who, again, sure. ran that 4-3-3. Yeah. He is the predominant player for not double counting speed. Yes. Don't double count his speed. I mean, obviously, Xavier really Worthy was the primary one, right? Like, he's don't double count his speed. We knew he was fast. Um, maybe not that fast, but yes, fast. I, I predicted a 4 2 9 in a group text that I was in for Worthy. I was like four two nine. I think I think Worthy can get that, and then he blew me away at, at broke the record at four two one. Absolutely, just just still again, it's an insane number. Something Crazy. very interesting with Brian Thomas Jr.'s acceleration. He ran. He had a one point five ten yard split. Only I didn't point, see that coming. Point one second off of Xavier Worthy's. That tells you one. It tells you how much how much ground Xavier Worthy made up at after the 10 yard <laughs> yeah. split um but also this guy's excel got ridiculous acceleration 63 210 pounds this is a vertical x receiver and teams are going to be yeah we want one of those we want yeah. one of those and yes he is a bona fide first round draft pick right now not because of his tape because of his athletic score and because right. of his speed and that's okay. Correct. That's okay. Um, going back to his tape, again, we don't double count the speed. We knew that. We knew he could jump. We knew he had great body control, awareness at the sideline, hands, all of that stuff. You know, nearly 10-inch hands, 32 and a, a three-quarters inch arms. So this guy is the prototypical build for an X receiver in the NFL with speed. The growth is why he's going to be going in the first round. From last year to this past year, or two years ago to this past year, he grew as a player. Now, having Malik neighbors on the opposite side of you is always going to help, or lined up in a bunch, or lined up in the stack is always going to help you a little bit. But what he still has to do is grow as a, a receiver. He's a junior. He's coming out as a junior, and he still has some learning to do. And teams, again, they, they love that. Regardless of whether or not they're going to really develop him as a, a route runner, well, that's going to be – we're going to have to wait and see on that. But – Great pedigree because why LSU wide receivers, for whatever reason, continuously pump out legit players. We're going to skip over Terrace Marshall really quickly, but that is the that is the worry. That's right? the conversation, though. That's the floor. That's the worry. You're, and That's and the listen, floor. you and I were both Terrace Marshall guys. Yes. I liked him. I liked him coming out, and then he has just face planted in the league. But Correct. what was the scenario there? An LSU wide receiver. And listen, I know that's a helmet scouting and different quarterbacks and different whatever. He was a number. He was a second option next to two elite options, Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase in that LSU offense. But again, he's not having to go against the top corners of these other teams. They're not shading coverage his way. Right. It's the same thing that was happening with Brian Thomas Jr. You're accounting so much for uh, the really, really, really fast guy on the other side that Brian Thomas Jr. is getting the number two corner and a lot of times not really much safety help over the top. So if he's able to win on a go route or yeah. a stutter and go or just something deep, which is what he does, that's why he led the country in touchdowns this year is because he was just getting those bombs down the sideline against man coverage. Exactly. And I'm going to be interested in which quarterback gets him. Because Jaden yeah. Daniels... Through the best deep ball in this class by a large margin. He's the most consistent. He and he's the best, the most accurate deep ball outside the numbers thrower in this class. So yeah. just 
understand that he's going to be taken probably in the top 20, 25. I don't you know. know it's, I it's, wouldn't do it, but I understand it. I, I understand drafting really good athletes that run fast that are big. I really, I really understand it. Like I really do. The league, the league loves those prototypes. And it's funny because we were seeing mock drafts two months ago that were saying that he was going to go top 15, top 20, and we scoffed at it. And now I'm oh, looking at it and I'm going, whoo, might be eating a it's little fair. bit of crow on that one because it looks like it's happening <laughs> at this Absolutely. point. It, again, like you said, it doesn't mean that I would. I don't have a first round grade on him, but I think that there are going to be teams that just want that size, speed, X, downfield threat combo. Absolutely. And in my opinion, though, it gives him kind of a narrow path to success in the league because he's going to have to be a dominant X, but I think that he's going to have to threaten route running more than he did in college in order to win on those deep routes because if they give him 10 yards cushion, and then just go beat me underneath. I dare you. Like he might have to learn some other pitches instead of just balls. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I'm curious to see what his development is going to look like. But at this point, um, I think there's a really good chance he's the fourth wide receiver taken just because of that size speed combo and what he can do on, on deep balls. So it's interesting. I, it's going to happen though. And I don't think he's going to get past. Let's see. I'm looking here. Mm. God, Jacksonville at 17. Oh yeah, that's that sounds like a match made in heaven, doesn't it? Yep. <laughs> I mean that that could be a, a very realistic situation for a Brian Thomas Jr. fourth wide receiver off the board. Let's let's move over to some uh players that didn't exactly excel. And um we're gonna start with the one that breaks my heart the most. Let's talk about Oregon boy Troy Franklin. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's keep it in the wide receiver room. Maybe just one or two more wide receivers, and then get to some other positions here. Yeah. But Troy Franklin didn't run as fast as I wanted him to run, or I thought that he could run. Um, didn't look great running the gauntlet, and to me, I think that was arguably the biggest knock of the day for him is how he handled the gauntlet. The gauntlet drill shows your fluidity, your ability to stay on a straight line, stay accelerated, catch with your hands, trust your hands. And he was making it an S curve all the way down the line. And it was very concerning. You were there in person. What'd you think about my Oregon boy, Troy Franklin? It wasn't even just that. Like he, he weighed in at 176. I'm like, okay, you're, you should be running four, three, five, four, three, three. Yeah. We got four, four, one. And we didn't even get him running again. He did not run again, which concerned me a little bit. And his 10-yard split was 161. We're talking about a guy who looks fast in acceleration based on tape. Yep. So, again, go back to it. Maybe it was just jitters. Maybe he didn't properly prepare. That's worrisome. Personally, if this is a big stage, this is – you have months to prepare. And it wasn't his best showing. And for me, it wasn't even just the gauntlet. It was everything. He did not look comfortable out there at all doing any of his routes any of the top of his routes any break points he looked uncomfortable now there, there was also speculation that he was having trouble with the field which yeah. okay i understand you got to figure something out something has to change here if you fall you fall like okay it's the field but being hesitant when other people specifically a guy like keon coleman who yeah. didn't have a great 40, but blew away the everything else, in my opinion, he, who outstaged the guy who's supposed to be one of the best route runners in this class. It, it was tough to watch because we know he's a better player than what he put out there in the combine. But the simple fact that we have, it looked like he was unprepared for the 40. It didn't look like he knew what he was doing with any of the drills. Did he prepare for the field drills at the combine? That's the question that's floating around right now. And when you have questions like that, regardless of whether or not they're appropriate, because again, his film says otherwise, they are there. Now they're there, and that's going to drop him down some boards. Now, interview processes change things. We don't have any information on real interviews and anything like that. Um, we'll see how his, he handles his pro day. That'll be another opportunity to do maybe run a gauntlet. 
ish type thing and do some more drills, do some more field work. Maybe he runs a better 40 time at his, uh, his pro day. We'll find out. I'll just uh, be over here crying in the corner. Don't mind me. Um, Cause I've been <laughs> kind of the table hard for Troy Franklin for basically three years. <laughs> I still, yeah. I still like what Troy Franklin offers as an NFL wide receiver. I do. I, I think if you're comparing him to guys like A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas Jr., I still think that Troy Franklin offers similar upside and maybe a little bit more polish, and he definitely has a better production profile than both those guys. So yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue my case a little bit and say that hey, a bad combine does not make. A, him a bad prospect because it was a it was not a good combine for him but he still has a lot of green check marks in his profile as a prospect so at this point um i think i am pretty comfortable saying that xavier worthy is probably my wide receiver for now i think i'm gonna flip flop mm -hmm. the two um but i still think that troy franklin offers a ton of upside and hey maybe it just means that the dream of him going to the bills at 28 is more alive and well but after them cutting basically everyone yesterday uh wide receiver <laughs> might not be the most most impactful position at 28 we'll see what happens uh feel free to hit me up on twitter to discuss that situation that was fun let's let's see one more wide receiver maybe let's talk about ricky let's talk about ricky pearson yeah, as another as another wide receiver Came in there, ran a strong 40 time at the 441, and basically jumped out the building, looked smooth in the on field drills. Hey, we've loved him. We've been on it for a while. And I think that he's very, very firmly entrenched as a day two draft target, probably round two at this point. I think that he's one of the best route runners uh, in this draft class. I think he and Lad McConkey are putting in a fight for who's the best, best route runner right now. Both guys that we love and both guys that absolutely cooked the combine. Yeah, you, I would not have expected his uh, athletic score to be what it was. Like, just everything he did, it was ridiculous and insane. That also goes back to usage, right? How are you used in your offense? What is your offense? Florida's offense was garbage and not very good. Yep. And we saw, okay, hey, Ricky, go get open. Buddy, go get open. Figure out a way to be available to your quarterback because he has speed. He has actual speed, but it wasn't used on tape. So, this is where it becomes difficult, right? This is, we don't have visual evidence on tape. We have a combine that you can prepare for, right? So 6'1", 189, by all accounts, this is a prototypical good body structure route running type of wide receiver. I have questions. I don't know. Are we going to see him run down the field in the NFL and just kind of take the top off and take a couple deep balls. I don't, I don't know that. I also don't believe his three cones, six, six, four. I don't believe it. I don't <laughs> see that on tape. I don't see his change of direction, his ability to create yards after the catch. Um, 17 bench press reps. Like you, you could not have put me in a chair and said, predict Ricky Pearsall's combine numbers. I would have not come close to any one of these. So, I want, and, and the fact that he played basketball too, like I've seen clips of him now playing basketball. I'm just like, Florida, what are you doing? What are you doing down there? You're making Ricky Pearsall something into something he's not, and I'm not okay with that. So it was a fantastic performance, and I'm, I'm hopeful that he can transition and translate this to the NFL because what he put on tape at Florida, whether his fault or not, is not this. I agree with that. He's not some athletic wonder, even though his testing showed it. I don't know. Maybe this just shows us that he has the ability to develop into something more because the athletic Be ability more. is there. And Florida didn't showcase that. It's yeah. crazy. There was a, they put it up on the screen. They're doing all kinds of like number comps on the screens during, during the combine. I was watching at home in my pajamas. You were there in person, but <laughs> they put Ricky Pearsall up on the screen next to Chris Olave. I don't know if he saw this. Uh, I did they put it up there this was... because they, they both measured in around six, one Olave was half an inch shorter, uh, similar weight. Olave ran a 4.39, Pearsall ran a 4.41. They both had a 1.5, 10-yard split. I can't think of two wide receivers that play much more differently than these two. So putting them on the screen together, I think, is a disservice to Ricky Pearsall 
Olave was a top 10 pick. I think he was yeah. right right around there, pick nine, something like that. Uh, Ricky Pearson is not going to be the number nine overall pick. But maybe he does have that athleticism in him. Maybe he can develop into being something more than just a good route running kind of slot wide receiver, showing that he has a 42-inch vert, a 10-9 yeah. broad, <laughs> 4 4 one forty a 1.57 10 yard split. It's like, okay, Ricky, ball out. Go ahead then. Like, show me. I love it. So, I, hey, listen, we we love us some Ricky Pearsall. I think oh, yeah. that he can be a very good NFL wide receiver. You were saying that he could be this year's Puka Nakua. It's possible. I'm I'm not ruling that out at all. I think that it's it's fine still holding on to that that early call flag plant and see what he develops into at the next <laughs> level. Yeah, I think that we're we're past that point because he's not going to be drafted on day three. Uh, no. So we got to find somebody else that's going to be doing that. Uh, but Ricky's definitely not going to be. Let's transition over to some teammates. Uh, yeah. Two guys that really helped their own draft stock. I'm not as confident that J.J. McCarthy helped his draft stock personally. But what he did do is show everybody that he has a strong arm. And I personally believe during the deep ball drills, he was like, I'm just going to throw this as far as I possibly can and not yep. care about accuracy. Um, the difference between him and Joe Milton is that Joe Milton would put it into a bucket at that distance, and he has legit deep accuracy. And JJ's like, you know, my deep ball has never been my strong point, but I'm going to launch it out there anyway. He could throw the ball down the field very well. And then he also was only one mile per hour difference on the hardest throw with the guy who I believe was very close to the record set by Josh yeah. Allen and, and, and Joe Milton. So he has a live arm, guys. If anyone yes. was questioning J.J. McCarthy's arm, please stop. It's there's, it's over. It's done with. And his teammate, Blake Corum, 4-5-3, which was a fantastic number for him. I did not expect him to go a, a below 4-6. So anything other than that was really great, obviously. He killed just about everybody in the on-field drills. He was so smooth. He was so good. And there's, and again, 27 reps at 225. I know he has short arms. I don't really care. <laughs> He's, it's insane how strong this guy is. And these guys, both out of Michigan, are going to be day one and day two picks. And I think at this point, it, it's well-deserved for both. I agree. I think J.J. McCarthy at this point uh, is is – the the firm candidate to be the fourth quarterback taken. Um, I think he's going somewhere in the teens. Maybe he cracks the top 10. Maybe there's a team that wants to leapfrog others and go up and get him. It could happen. I still feel exactly the same about JJ McCarthy now as I felt about him a couple months ago, which is that we know yeah. the raw ability is there. We also have questions about the development because he wasn't asked to do very much. I Let still think he... Here. Please. I still think he could have gone back and been the first overall pick next year. I still think that that's within the no realm question. of possibility. Like, no question. And I, I yeah. think that that would have been a smart choice to have more yeah. development and, and take that time because next year's quarterback class is not going to be super strong. But we know what we know what he has in the tool bag, and he's consistently been able to show that he can throw into windows, that he has that live arm, that he has the athleticism. It wasn't really shocking to see what he did. I still think that a team is gambling on him a little bit if they're taking him around that top 10 to 15 number, because please, like you were, you were whispering in, in my ear there, let him sit a year. Yes, I agree. Please yeah. let him sit. Don't just throw him out there week one or week three to some team. Like if he goes to Denver and Denver asks him to be the week one starter now that Russell Wilson's gone, Boy, that is an uphill battle. I wouldn't want to see it. Maybe he's able to thrive in it because he does have natural ability and good leadership skills, yeah. and he's just a winner, and they they wouldn't shut up about how many games he's won on the, the TV coverage. All he does is win since <laughs> high school. He's lost like two games total. Um, but I don't think that throwing him out there week one is is doing him any favors. I want him to go somewhere where he can learn from a veteran and sit even if that veteran isn't a super talented veteran, but at least it's like a bridge quarterback to get J.J. a year. Oh, God, I think that's benefit for his development. Yeah, I'm still on the Seattle go up and get this guy so you can sit him behind Geno Smith for Great. a year and develop him. I would love to see it, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, I wouldn't mind him going to Denver because I think he and Sean Payton would be a good fit, but you do need a quarterback 
in my opinion, to start the first year. You have to accept you're going to tank the first year if you're yeah. in that situation to to go a different route because Denver's rebuilding. Let's be very, very upfront about that. It looks yeah. like Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy aren't going to be there. If you go and get a guy like J.J. McCarthy, you better have a quarterback to sacrifice that year. It's, it should not be J.J. It should not be. Um, if you have a team built to win now and you want to drop them in there, Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to complain too much about it, but still think he should sit here. Um, go get go get Tanny, go get Ryan Tannehill to, yeah. to be a bridge quarterback oh. and let JJ McCarthy sit right here. Yep, doesn't anybody sure. anybody at this point? I don't care. Um, but yes, I think both of these players are deserving their spots. Just a little bit different on what we think that they're going to be able to do early on in their career. I, I think we need to address specifically one of the players that you were pretty high on um, at the Senior Bowl before that. Cameron Kitchens, Miami safety, had one of the Boy. stinkiest Boy NFL combines. Not even just with his performance during the drill, like during the uh, the his 40, 40, his vertical is broad. On field, he looked kind of lost. Yeah. I was out there watching the safeties, and he did not look fluid. He didn't look like he knew where the ball was going. It looks like he was trying to guess where the coaches were going to point next so he could get a better jump because he's too busy trying to guess and not allowing his athletic ability to do it for him. Like that's yeah. the part. That's why the drills on the field are done. It's so that you have to react to where that coach is pointing, where that ball is going. If you can't, we have a little bit of a problem. And in Kitchen's just I, – I really don't have much else to say, man. I know he's one of your guys, but it was a <sighs> very bad performance. It was a super bad performance. I had him in a really similar t- – to me, he was never like the clear-cut runaway number one safety in this class. Yeah. He was one of a handful of guys. And now I'm looking at this going – Boy, is he safety three? Is he safety four in this draft yeah. class? That was rough. And like I said on Troy Franklin, a bad combine does not make a player, but it does matter, especially when you see them on the field with other top prospects and an inability to navigate these drills, like you were saying. His yeah. athleticism score, according to NFL.com, was a 58, putting him at safety 25 in this class. For the athleticism factor. Yeah. The lack of instincts on the field was rough. Hey, cool. 35 inch vert, pretty good. But a 9 2 broad, a 4 6 5 40. Oh, man. Just not what you want to see, especially from a guy that you're wanting to be a post safety. You're wanting this guy to be a field ranger, a center fielder, to be able yeah, to go sideline sure. to sideline, to be able to cover those deep routes. That like his, his hips look stiff. There wasn't the fluidity that you need to be able to yeah. change directions and the burst to cover ground to get from like opposite hash to sideline, which sometimes safeties are asked to do. Yeah, That wasn't there. I mean, I'm thinking about the safety class right now and I'm like, Jaden Hicks out of Washington state, probably have him right now as my safety one. Tyler Newbin might be there at number two. Cam Kinchins maybe is, is in conversation for safety three. Uh, but yeah, that was a really, really rough show. It's tough, man. And again, we, I'm not going to sit here and preach that the combine is everything because it's not, yep. but what it should do again, we go back to the tape is cam kitchens going to be a field, a field general. Is he going to be out there as the guy at the back of your defense? Or you see him now as somebody who needs to be in a too high system, who maybe is more of a box safety, someone yep. who, who, who not, who might need to do that first before you trust him as a as a single high. Learn the game a bit more because that's that's there. If you don't have that athletic ability, you have to be able to anticipate. You have to be able to see what's happening. And the only way you can do that is by gaining experience. So it's going to make some teams guess and have to figure that out. And specifically with the safety position, this free agent class is fantastic. Teams yep. aren't going to be needing a ton of high safeties especially in the draft. So we're talking about a guy who might fall based on that and because he didn't test well. So all of these factors start to start to stack against players that don't have good performances at the combine. 
that's going to lead me to another player that people were really, really excited about. Um, they thought he was going to run a faster 40 because it looked like he was faster on tape. And it's Audric Estime running back out of Notre Dame. <laughs> Really disappointed a lot of people with a four yeah. seven one forty, nearly a one six uh ten yard split. I mean, his vertical and his broad vertical 38 inches, broad 10 5. The lower the lower half explosion we knew was there. Like we knew that was there. That that's not the problem. But going back to the free agent class, this is a fantastic running back free agent class, too. And specifically for Audric, like I thought this could have been an opportunity for him to say. I'm I'm day two worthy. I'm day two worthy. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't just the 40 or the 10. It was the on-field drills. It looked, he looked slow. He it, it wasn't just the the speed down. It was the getting over bags, through bags. He looked slow doing all of it. And he doesn't have pads on. Um for a running back, again, he's 221 pounds and 5'11, 221. So that's a good. It's a really good number of 32 inch arms, 10 inch hands. Like, okay, this running back is, is got the stuff. And then he runs a four, three or a four, seven, one. And I'm just like, uh, I don't know about that. So how do you feel about um, Notre Dame running back, Audric Estime and how he performed at the combine? To me, Audric Estime was always a guy that I, I felt was more of a round four, round five type running back. Mm -hmm. And that kind of still holds true to me for sure. Maybe leaning more of a round five now, but he's, not a guy, in my opinion, that was going to be a workhorse in a backfield, but he was going to be a guy that can come in and be a thumper. And, and NFL teams right now, they're looking by they're looking at running back by committee, which is one of the most played out terms in the history yeah, of football. Sure. But it's true. That's how backfields are constructed now. They're almost constructing backfields like they're constructing wide receiver rooms. You're trying to build a basketball team of a variety of skill sets. Oh, yeah. Running backs are kind of doing the same thing now. And Absolutely. guess what? He's a power forward. That's what Audric Estime is going to be for you. He's big. He's powerful. He's built in the lower half. He's a, a thumper of a goal line guy. But you still want to see more of that explosiveness, more ability to create. Um, and, and I didn't see a whole lot of that on film, but I still yeah. like him to be a role player in the NFL. There's going to be teams that like it. You were talking about this, this free agent class. And listen, by all accounts it's the greatest running back free agent class <laughs> in recent memory we're talking about derrick henry josh jacobs saquon barkley tony pollard austin eckler those are superstar running backs but does it matter the way that the league is currently matter. trading running backs <laughs> I, it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's josh jacobs the rushing king two years ago and is still healthy and has plenty of tread on tires they're going to look at it and go, do I need to spend $12 million on you or I just drafted a guy in the third, fourth, fifth round? I'm not saying Audric Estime is going to give you Josh Jacobs' production. He's not. But I don't think this free agent class really changes a lot of front office viewpoints, which sucks because I love running backs. Like I love them, but they are so yeah. devalued right now across the league. Two out of those five teams that I did go on. Like, that's just the reality of the situation. It seems to happen every year. Dalvin Cook was one of the best running backs in the league until all of a sudden yeah. he wasn't. Leonard Fournette was killing it for Tampa Bay, and he's unemployed. Like, it just it, it happens all the time. Austin Eckler, I feel like, is going to be one that might really struggle to to get back to a prominent role in an offense anywhere. And over the last five years, he was one of the best running backs in the league. All five of these guys were five of the top 10 running backs yeah. in the last like sure. three to five years in the NFL. But they're so undervalued now from a position. And their NFL teams are looking at what percentage of their cap space do they want to spend at the running back position. We look at the stat every year. We're talking about Super Bowl winners and who their starting running back is. That happens every single year. And there's that chart. And then every year you just add a new line under it for who the next or who the running back was. Isaiah Pacheco, seventh round pick, your Kansas City Chiefs. Like it, every year, it, it just seems to be more and more and more going that way where they're like, I can just find a guy. I can just find a guy in the draft on day three that's going to give me decent production. And maybe that player pops and turns into the next Rashad White. Isaiah Pacheco, 
late round running back type that ends up becoming a top 10 guy in the league. So I feel so bad. I think Derrick Henry is going to have a market. I think Josh Jacobs will. I think Saquon is going to struggle to get the money that he says that he wants. Um, Austin Eckler is going to be tough. Tony Pollard, in my opinion, should they, they should sign him back in Dallas. Um, But we'll, we'll see what happens in free agency next week. Oh boy. Six days till free agency starts. We'll have a lot to talk about after that. Um, but the running back position right now, super devalued deep ish running back class, but no real top headliners except for one Trey Benson, Florida state university. Oh man. RB one just dominated the combine at his size to run a four, three, nine 40 was just silly talk. We're putting him in in kind of rare company, like your prototype running back, what every NFL team loves. His size and speed combo was like Jonathan Taylor when yeah. he came out, Kenneth Walker. Um, there was one other that they talked about, Brees Hall. Brees Hall size speed yeah, combo Brees also. Hall, yeah. Like these these very recent last four years, prototypical kind of workhorse running backs, Trey Benson fits the mold from the size athleticism profile. Yeah, we're going to be talking about a couple of Florida Staters here for just a second. So hold yep. on tight with, uh, with, uh, Trey, <laughs> yeah, with Trey Benson. Uh, these, I, I I don't know what they're doing down in Florida State, but after a rough stretch of it the last, what, 10-ish years, they've got something right. Uh, Jared Verse was another huge winner this week. And yep. Trey Benson just comes in and shows you that I'm big, I'm fast, I'm athletic. That is the kind of running back that is going to go into he might be the first running back drafted because of the size and the speed yeah like i i think that that could be a needle mover for a lot of these teams they didn't know what he was going to run because like yeah he's he's got the power he has like the footwork but does he have the straight line speed to take it in the nfl I'm telling you right now, four three nine. That that shows up on tape too. That's not just yep. a, a a number here. It looked like he may have trimmed it down a little bit for this, but not much. Maybe and maybe four you, or five pounds, kind of. Yeah, you know, maybe like four just or five a little pounds. bit of shredding. But I mean, even look, talk about shredded. This dude was <laughs> shredded, and he looked every bit of the underwear Olympics that it should be like. That's the guy <laughs> that should be on the the cover of this. He was absolutely built in a lab at running back. And I loved watching him do the drills. He was smooth. He was fast, explosive. And that's why I think that we're probably looking at the first running back drafted. I think we are too. And in my opinion, I don't really think that it's close. I think the only one that could threaten is Marshawn Lloyd. I think that he's done everything to help himself. He also tested very well, has the size, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that he could be in the conversation for some teams also, but to me, it's, it's Trey Benson. Uh, quite literally running away with the running back position. He came in at six foot, 216 pounds, nine and a quarter inch hands. He's got big mitts, four, three, nine, 40, a one, five, two, 10. I'm sorry. What did, what, what was the 10 yard split on Xavier worthy? It was a one, four, nine, one, four, nine. <laughs> and he was a one, five, two at, at 216 pounds. He's got to be a by like 50 pounds. A 33 and a half hurt, not the biggest in the world, fine. A broad jump at 10 too. He's explosive. He's athletic. He's absolutely shredded. He's dominant. He has the the build and the the health profile, like the longevity, the ability to be a workhorse guy. This is a running back that you can give 15 to 20 carries to a game, which is about the most that most teams are asking right now. I think he's going in the second round. I think that he's a potential workhorse for a team. I don't know what team that's going to be yet. I think the second round is going to be very interesting because I think there's going to be a run on wide receiver in the second round. So where does Trey Benson kind of end up going is, is going to be super fascinating. But I think that he, he was dominant. He was silky smooth at that size. The footwork in all the bag drills looked terrific. And again, yeah. it checks out on tape. This is not just a great combine workout. His tape is excellent. He has pull away speed. He has strength to power to speed. He can he can tempo it. He can be agile in short areas. I think Trey Benson right now is is kind of locked in as the RB one for most teams. 
Abs- you know, absolutely. Now that that's let's do it. Let's talk about our guy, Fisky Business here. Fisky Great Business Fisk, baby. was one of the best players at the senior bowl, was one of the biggest winners of the senior bowl, and is the biggest winner, even more so than Xavier Worthy, the biggest winner of the 2024 NFL Combine. I'm the most the athletic. You should be. This is what this is all about. A guy right. who was a senior, a fourth-year senior, and not a lot of people really knew Braden Fisk coming into the pre-draft process. Every single person knows his name. Yep. He was the most athletic defensive tackle in this class, according yep. to these numbers. Does it show up on tape? No. But he's incredibly explosive. We, he twitched. has the workhorse mentality. This guy does not give up on place. Does not do it. He is a he is going to be a huge glue guy in the NFL. He yes. never gives up and the athletic stuff, it, it it's there. Like the 1 6 8 10 yard split, you see that. He is get off the ball and he yeah. goes and he, again, he works. He's got great pass rush skills. And then 26 reps on the bench, I did not expect either. That was different from what I from what I saw from him on tape. I didn't see a ton of the upper body strength, specifically when it was coming to handling double teams and being able to anchor there. That is where the explosiveness, that's where the broad jump and the vertical jump kind of come in. Like he ran, he, he jumped 33 and a half in the vertical, had a 9-9 broad. So there's a little bit of deficiency there. But, I mean, the guy's 292 pounds. I'll give him a pass, all right? <laughs> like, I got no problems. And I think he might have actually bulked up a little bit because it's 6'4", 292, 31-inch arms. He does kind of have small arms. That's the, short one, arms. the one thing. And he's got short, short arms, arms, guys. He does. So but you, know what, you know what's interesting, though, is that if you watch the tape, offensive linemen don't get their hands into his chest very often. He's so and good with his rush, hands. Though. Yeah. Not in pass rush. In in run, it does show up every once in a while. But in pass rush, he has a really great ability to work his hands and not allow guys with two, three inch longer arms than he has to get into his chest and body him. I don't, dude. He's I was just, I was, I was so giddy. I was so giddy watching the athletic testing. And then this big dude was like, "Hey, I told people I was going to do everything, so he did. He went out there and he did the the shuttle as a yeah. defensive tackle." And I'm like, "I love it." Like it's terrific. Four three seven. Four yeah. three seven short shuttle. Yup. Yup. Excuse me. <laughs> there were running backs and wide receivers that didn't come close to that number. It's yeah. it's absurd what he did. Yeah. Hats off. Uh we, we need the name of the strength and conditioning coach down at Florida State because we uh, I need to know, Yeah. <laughs> get in here. Let's talk about all your guys and what went into this. I would love to have that conversation because all of them, other than Keon Coleman's 40, but we'll just ignore that. Every everyone else basically, and well, hey, he had a 21 mile per hour on field speed running the gauntlet. So hey, that's fine. <laughs> but all these guys, just all the Florida State guys, just balled out in the athletic yeah. testing, and it shows up on film too. For like, I I'm a big Fisky business fan. I, I I like his tape a lot. I think he's good. I don't have really concerns about him being undersized. No, he's not defensive tackle one in this class. That does belong still to Byron Murphy. Um, but I think that he's in conversation to be the second defensive tackle drafted. I think that Tavondra Sweat's size and his he didn't trim down. We talked about it. I wanted him down in like the 330, 340 range, and it didn't happen. He weighed in at 365 in the 360s, whatever the number was, 365, 366. Weighed in huge. His athletic testing was atrocious, which again, you're not expecting him to be uber athletic, but it's like, hey, cool, you're really big, but like you gotta be able to to be an athlete on the field too. I think there's questions about that. I think Jerjon Newton could be in conversations. Uh, obviously, he's the kind of front runner to be the second yeah. defensive tackle drafted, in my opinion. But I think that everything that that Fisky business done in this pre draft process, I think there's gonna be teams that are just in love. That just love him. That love the athleticism. That love the way he interviews. Loves the personality and the tenacity that he shows. Like you said, he does not take a play off. I think there's going to be teams out there that have him as their second defensive tackle on the board, and I don't hate it. I think that he's very, very good. It's it's fair. I, I think that teams are going to look at guys like 
Ruko Ohoro and Chris Jenkins. Ohoro, I apologize because I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. It's just I trip over it. And you know, Chris Jenkins, who are 6'3, 300 with the 34 inch arms and the athletic ability, yeah. and say his arms can't get longer. Like, I still think he's going in the top 50. I wouldn't have said that a month ago. I, I do yep. believe right now Fisk is a top 50 player on the board, which is is insane. So hats off to him for crushing the pre-draft process. I, I have nothing but love for you, and I wish you the absolute best in the NFL because it could be a lot of fun. Let's end here quickly on a couple of big guys, all right? Yeah. Let's talk about some offensive linemen who really also – kind of helped solidify themselves because the number one player I think that had the most to prove as an offensive tackle was Troy Fatanu. And he absolutely showed he can be an NFL tackle, 34 yes. inch arms. Okay. All right. Everyone had the questions for whatever reason we Check. have confirmation. It's all checked off now. Yeah. He's six, he's six, three. I don't care so much about that. Great feet. We saw on the on-field drills, oh. he was he moved the smoothest and the best out of any tackle there. Period. End of story. He moved yep. incredibly well. No Strength, argument. Power, athletic ability, arm length, and the ability to when it counts in the red zone to turn into this absolute <sighs> bulldozer. He's a tackle, and he's probably going in round one. I'm just. Uh... My heart is all afloat. We love him. We've been talking about him. He's one of the most fun studies in this yes. class. I love watching Trey Fatani tape because he can move. And when you're watching the on-field drills, the wave drill, the you know the, the the change of direction that they're asking the guys to do, and the footwork, and is he comfortable in that base? Is he comfortable staying in that position and sh and shuffling? He was butter, and yeah. it does show Amazing. on tape. It checks out everything about his play style. He was able to just highlight at the combine, which I love to see, the movement skills, the, the hand skills, the athleticism. It, it got, uh, I, don't, I don't want to imagine what it would look like seeing this dude pulling and coming <laughs> downhill at me. I would, just, I would just get out of the way. Be like, go ahead. Open door for you, sir. Uh, have fun. But he is so silky. Um, he's absolutely in conversation as one of the top offensive tackles in this in this class. I think um, Joe Alt mm -hmm. is absolutely right there, who also looked very good. I think another name that we need to touch on is Talise Fuaga, Oregon yeah. State, who also looked just silky i keep using the same word but he looks yep. so smooth with it on the field again great footwork great balance great agility side to side the change of direction the ability to stay you know on task and in his base it was so fun because we had patanu and fuaga and they do all these drills in alphabetical order so they were like i think there was one other guy separating them if i remember who i can't think of who it was right now but they were in very close succession in all these on-field drills yep. And it was fun just to see them next to each other, just continue to go. And it was almost like they were playing a game of like one up with each other and like, who can do that drill better? They both look terrific. A couple of PAC 12 offense alignment in the PAC 12s last year. Thank you. Pacific Northwest, Oregon state out of Corvallis, university of Washington up in Seattle. Absolutely love it. But I think Talise Fuaga, there, there are some people out there that have to Fuaga now as one off attack in the draft class. And I think that he's, Looking like a top 10 pick. Personally, I think that I would go Trey Vitano over to Lee Fuaga. What are your thoughts? I understand it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I completely get it. It depends on what you need, right? Yep. I think that Fuaga is a right tackle. I don't think he's playing left for you. So that comes into consideration. If you have a left tackle and you're in the top 10 and you need a right tackle, you say, okay, we have Fuaga higher on our board. And I understand 6'6", 324 pounds, and he moves like that. Big. Okay. Yeah, we're going to be talking about this guy for a while who's going to stay in the NFL for a long time. He's like what Darnell Wright was coming out of Tennessee mm -hmm. last year, except he looks better. Right now, he, he looks much better. And that should also tell you how good this tackle class is because Darnell Wright was tackle two taken off the board last year by the Bears. Like, we're, this is 
a really it's a really good class. It's top heavy. It's got depth on day two. And Talise Fuaga, uh, he's not going to be the first tackle taken because all also, like I said, was phenomenal yep. in the drills. It was incredible to watch him. You know, we saw about his tight end background. Yeah, that 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 matches up on tape and it shows on the field. So I still think Olu is going to be up there too. I think he's going to go as the second um, tackle drafted. Um, we're not even going to. We haven't even talked about Amarius Mims, who also might throw himself into this conversation. But those are the five. Real good. Oh, those are the big five, right? Those are the big five. And however you want them, I'm not going to argue too much. Um, they all do things extremely well. And Mims may be the most projection based, but in pass protection, he's fantastic. So when it comes to Fuaga, like he's the only guy right in the top five that I say, you're going to play right tackle and that's it. He's the only one. I mean, maybe you could, you could probably condense him inside too. But at the, at the end of the day, if you need a right tackle, Fuaga's your guy. I want to have a conversation that we've had before, right before we wrap this up. When we were down in Mobile, we were standing outside. We were waiting for our lift. We talked about a hypothetical trade. Yeah. We talked about the New York Jets trading up to five, get their third off of tackle to protect Aaron Rodgers, which would be a Joe Alt. We talked about that being with the Chargers to move down, who could then also get another one of these offensive tackles. What position do the Chargers need on the offensive line? It's right tackle. It's not yeah. left. They've got Corey Lindsley. Lindsley's not going anywhere. I could you absolutely see this. It just, I'm sorry, Slater. Sorry. Yes, not Lindsay. Slater. They've got Slater locked in at left tackle. I could absolutely see this coming to fruition. It just it's more and more solidifying. Like, hey, Joe Alt is absolutely terrific and he's huge. He's 6'9, 321. That is a just <laughs> mammoth of an offensive <laughs> lineman. <laughs> Six nine, like he was on the field next to other offensive linemen and looked massive. It was stupid, but I could see this happening. I could see the Chargers, who need a lot, trading down a few picks, trying to get Talise Fuaga to be their right tackle, and adding a day two pick on top of that to help this rebuild for Harbaugh. And what if that pick turns into Blake Corum? Probably does. Oh, it probably we does. Just, like let's we be honest, just Jim mic Har drop it. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh is going to be drafting Blake Corum. Like you can almost set that in stone. <laughs> I feel like right, like that's his guy. Blood, sweat, tears, all that going for it. But yes, that that that's starting to become the thing. Like we believe that's going to happen. I also think the Chargers could trade could trade down again. That wouldn't that shock me in the slightest if they traded down from ten, especially if they're like maybe we can go down two spots and just draft Brock Bowers. Because that's very another possibility there. If especially, oh, maybe someone wants to come up to 10 and grab, I don't know, JJ McCarthy, come yep. draft him. We'll come down with the Minnesota Vikings at 12. Uh, they could do the double move back. It wouldn't shock me in the slightest. I think that they are one of the most fascinating teams to watch in this draft process. Yes. It's going to get real fun. But hey, I think that's a great place for us to end it. Hell of a job. Good job uh, getting down there and having a lot of fun and, and all the inf insights that you provided being on hand in person. That's it. That's the combine. Now it is oh, man. full steam ahead to the draft, buddy. I think next week we need to come up with one position group and maybe go through a top five or a yeah. top 10 or something like that. We'll, we'll discuss it off air. But thank you guys so much for listening. As always, if you're listening on your favorite podcast, please follow and, and, and like and all the fun stuff on YouTube. Let's get that going. You can see our absolutely beautiful mugs, uh, which are just gorgeous. I mean, God, face for radio if you've ever seen one. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We will see you guys next week.